All right, everyone, let's begin. Today's lecture is going to cover everything that we haven't already covered in the domain of Middle English. So if you recall uh, from the video lectures from last time, what we talked about was the phonology, the sources and spelling, um, also the uh, morphology, both nominal and uh, verbal. And today, we're going to cover those aspects that remain, so the syntax, word formation, including derivation or morphology, also in terms of semantic change, in terms of uh, new words being formed and a few borrowings. And at the end of today, we're going to spend some time discussing sample exam questions so that you will have an idea what the exam at the end of the semester will look like. Um, this course is not going to be evaluated using the uh, evaluation form this year, but if you do want to provide feedback on the course, which I'd very much welcome, uh, please do, and there is an address here on the slides, um, sayat.me forward slash history of English, uh, and if you go there, you can provide anonymous feedback, um, whether positive or negative, uh, that I can then read. So if you have anything to say, if you have anything you think I could do better, uh, please do let me know. That also goes for those of you who are watching the video online version of this lecture. Okay, so does anyone have any questions before we begin? Mm, right, so the question is why doesn't English look more like French today? Um, and there are really two parts to, to this. First of all, English really does look quite a lot like French in many ways. In terms of the lexicon, depending on how you count, um, more than 50% of the lexicon of the language could be said to come from French. So in that respect, it is quite French-like. Um, we might still ask, why isn't it more like French? And I think that's the, the gist of the question. Um, some people have gone so far as to propose that English is a Creole, uh, as we saw last time, with, with French um, or with other languages. Um, I think the dominant opinion, dominant opinion now is that precisely because we don't see more influence from French, the Creole theory can't be the whole story. Um, we might expect to see a lot more than we do. In fact, when we, look for, when we see French influence, we see it in terms of the morphology of the language, um, derivational morphology, that is, and we'll come back to that today. Uh, we also see influence in terms of the lexicon, um, maybe some phonological influence, but not, nothing at all really in terms of inflectional morphology or in terms of syntax. Um, so the French influence was big, but it was never overwhelming. Um, and that was probably partly due to the fact that in terms of actual French speakers who were living in the British Isles, uh, there were never an enormous number. So the, um, the Anglo-Saxon migration uh, in the uh, 5th to 7th centuries was really very large indeed. Um, the consensus view is that the migration from Scandinavia to northeast England um, in the uh, particularly 9th and 10th centuries was also very large. Uh, the Normans who came to England, they were very socially important, but there probably weren't that many of them compared to the other migrations. So that, I think, uh, accounts maybe for why there isn't more structural influence of French. It was prestigious, uh, but it was never spoken by a, a huge proportion of the population as a native language, unlike, say, English itself, of course, or Scandinavian. Hopefully that's a, um, a partial answer. It's very difficult to give more convincing answers to this kind of questions, because there's still so much that we don't know about how language contact works. Let's look at some Middle English syntax then. Um, here's a passage uh, of Middle English, and uh, you can take a look at this, and I'd like you to tell me if there's anything that's, that, stand, that sort of springs out at you. Um, so the question is, is this Old or Middle English? The answer is, it's Middle English. And my question for you is, why? How do we know? What looks particularly, what, what do we have here um, that, deviates from what we'd expect from Old English. Well, I'll give you a clue. There is one little word that comes up an awful lot in this passage. The article, yeah. 
So when we look at this passage, um, we see the siege, the assault, uh, the boch, uh, the tulk, um, the tramas, uh, the troes. This little T-H-E word, or it's a thorn and then an E, of course, in, the, uh, in a Middle English text like this. Um, this, this text uh, is full of this word. And if you remember the Old English demonstrative paradigm, it's really complex. It depends whether the noun is masculine or feminine, whether it's plural, um, whether it's dative, genitive, accusative, nominative. All of that stuff crops up in Old English, just like it does in, in present-day German and in every stage of the history of German, in Middle English, it's gone. So these uh, demonstratives that were used in definite article function um, are gone now, and what instead we have is this invariant form, the, which is the form that we use today. So that's one big change, what one change that's very visible when you look at a text like this. When you compare it to Old English, this the, 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 um, rather than the se and thon and tham uh, and tha and seo uh, that you will be familiar with from Old English texts. This is a text called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Uh, I mentioned it last time. Uh, from the West Midlands from the 14th century. Very interesting text. Um, obviously, uh, it's about knights and uh, things. This is something that we find during the High Middle Ages uh, in... Uh, not just in the UK, not just in Britain, but also all across Europe, uh, we get this uh, flourishing of interest in chivalry and what knights do and don't do and what they should and shouldn't do and what their obligations are to their lord and to women and to everyone else. Um, and uh, this is a particularly interesting case uh, because most of the time knights are not faced with enemies uh, who, when decapitated, are still alive. And the Green Knight is an exception to this rule. Okay, uh, but we're talking about syntax. And here, there's a little overview of the syntactic changes that we see during the Middle English period. As I've said multiple times, what we see during the history of English is a transition from a more synthetic to a more analytic language. And that manifests itself on the morphological level and also on the syntactic level. Um, we've already talked about the morphology, so there's loss of case marking. By the end of the Middle English period, case marking is basically gone, except on the pronouns as we know it today. Gender as a uh, grammatical category is also lost during the Middle English period. Number marking is not lost entirely, but it's very much simplified. If you remember all of the different types of paradigm for nouns and for demonstratives, there were many, many different plural endings in Old English. In Middle English, there's really only one, and that is the S plural ending. Cats, cat, cats, dog, dogs, horse, horses. These S, Z, and S are all allomorphs of the same plural morpheme. We also see simplification of subject-verb agreement, so the verb has many, many different endings during the Old English period, and those get weeded out. A lot of them fall off. Um, it seems like uh, the morphology is shrinking. So we're moving away from this synthetic uh, profile when we enter the Middle English period. And how far we move away from the synthetic profile depends on the text. Because as I've said before, Middle English is very diverse and we see different things at different times and in different places. In terms of the syntax, we see not only that we've got this new definite article, the, but also we see that it's used absolutely everywhere. In Old English, use of the, dem use of the, uh, the demonstrative in article function um, was kind of optional. You didn't have to do it 100% of the time. You could have a singular definite referent with no definite article. Um, that's no longer the case in the Middle English period. Another analytic feature uh, that we have is that in adjectives, when you want to do comparatives and superlatives of adjectives, um, we find uh, rather than just adding ER and EST to everything, um, you get this uh, comparative more and superlative most. Um, so we would still say smart, smarter, smartest, but if we have an adjective like intelligent, we wouldn't say intelligent, intelligenter, intelligentest. 
in English, right? Does anyone know what the generalization is? When do we use more and most, and when do we use er uh and est? Exactly. So when the word is a one-syllable word like smart, you just use the morphology, you use smart er, smart est, but if it's a multisyllabic word like intelligent, you use more intelligent, most intelligent. Um, when it's a two-syllable word, there's actually some variation. So sometimes, so words like stupid, some people will say stupider and stupidest, and other people will say more or most stupid. So with two syllables, there is some variation, but in the modern language, whenever an adjective goes above one syllable, you start to have the option of using more and most, and when it goes above two syllables, you don't have any other choice. And this is something that, that actually marks out English among the Germanic languages. It's the only Germanic language that does this in the present day. Um, so this is quite a striking property. We find the very first examples in the late Old English period, but it's really during Middle English that this construction kicks off. More intelligent, most intelligent. We also see the word order rigidifying. Um, so we see a move towards SVO word order. In Old English, there was more variability. In Old English, we saw the verb second rule uh, applied, but uh, that didn't really restrict where the object and the subject appeared all that much. Um, in the modern language, on the other hand, SVO word order is virtually obligatory. So there's very little possibility for moving sentences around, moving the order of constituents around within a sentence. We see the subject appearing more, so we see an increase in the overt expression of subjects. And we also see some new sentence connectors. Um, so we see additional conjunctions, so coordinating conjunctions and subordinating conjunctions, um, that link different clauses together. And all of these are features that move English more in the direction of an analytic language. So, the big picture here is that we've got a trend from synthetic to analytic at this point. We've also got indefinite articles. So we talked about the definite articles developing at this point. Um, we also have indefinite articles developing. And the indefinite article um, develops from an interesting source. It's the same source as the German indefinite article, um, which is the numeral an. So the Old English numeral an actually grammaticalizes in two directions. It becomes the word one, um, O-N-E, um, and it also um, becomes the simple uh, indefinite article a or an. So uh, we've got a or an um, grammaticalizing as our indefinite article during this uh, during this period. Um, the reason I'm using this meme on the slide um, is because it illustrates very effectively the source of the German indefinite article in uh, the numeral, um, which I think in this meme context would probably be pronounced Einst, Einst, Einst echten Löwen. Um, so, um, we've got a numeral grammaticalizing as an indefinite article. And an early example we can, be see, can be seen in the... Um, in the Peterborough Chronicle. Um, he spared little, he spared a little, and begore a richter, for he was an evil man. Um, and this evil, an evil man, right? Um, now you can tell that this is an indefinite article and not a numeral, because it doesn't make sense for it to be a numeral here. He was one evil man. That would be strange. What we instead find is um, what, we, what it must be uh, here is simply an indefinite article. Um, so he was an evil man. Can anyone remind me what the generalization is for when you use a and when you use an in English? Yes, you use a if it's followed by a consonant and you use an if it's followed by a vowel. Um, basic stuff, but it might be interesting for you to think about how this arose historically, how it got to be like this in the first place. We're not going to go into detail on this, um, but uh, the textbook has some information about it, uh, and it is uh, an interesting development. Hey, I just asked you a question for which the answer was literally on the slide behind me. Uh, that was pretty stupid, really, but uh, thank you for humoring me by answering. <clears throat> okay, any questions? You mean, when, where is the distinction now, or where is this distinction in the older texts? Between... <laughs> 
Um, so in the older texts, um, it's in Old English, it's quite, it can be quite difficult to tell which you're dealing with. Um, but basically, it's just a broad brush semantic heuristic. The question is how we distinguish between an and, and one. Um, it's, I mean, basically, uh, it's roughly the same as it is in modern German, um, where ein uh, is used for both, ein and its inflected forms. Um, uh, in terms of exactly, in terms of exactly which one is used, you just have to look at the context. So the numeral, it's, it's a, it explicitly a numeral use if it's something that involves counting. So maybe you're talking about, I don't know, uh, one loaf of bread and five fishes or something. Um, but uh, in any other context where explicit counting is not required, it was, it's probably being used in an indefinite article function. But again, um, it's fairly hazy, especially in late Old English. You actually see the numeral an uh, being used much like ein in German. Okay. Now, insofar as word order is concerned, I've said that the language moves towards SVO, but that doesn't happen overnight. So this isn't something that the Old English speakers suddenly get. They wake up after the Norman Conquest and they're all suddenly speaking with SVO word order. Um, it's still quite like Old English for a long, long time. Uh, here we've got a text on the slide uh, from 1300. Um, from, this is a northern, the northern version of the Cursa Mundi, which we'll come back to later on. Um, so this is a long time, this is in the middle of the Middle English period, it's pretty much slap bang in the middle, and we see subject verb inversion. The finite verb is, and then the subject it. So, must, mostly, mostly, is it wrought, or worked, or made, for Frankis man, for a French man. And this also, you see, this is an example with no indefinite article. So, um, this also is a feature that takes some time to take hold. Language change is never instant uh, and uh, an immediate, it's always gradual. And this verb second rule is something that we see as late as Chaucer very productively. Chaucer actually, as I've said before, is really smart. Chaucer, when he's writing, is very conscious of the linguistic variables available to him, and he uses different variants um, in different contexts. Uh, now, Chaucer himself um, is from the East. He's from an area where verb second is maintained for longer, and he goes to London and spends most of his career in London, um, which is more southern. Uh, and when he is writing for his family, when he's writing texts like his treatise on the astrolabe, which was never intended for a broader audience, he uses more verb second. And when he uses, when he's writing for a wider audience, when he's writing for the public, he uses more of a mixture of word orders. Um, so he's, in other words, he's able to code switch between two different varieties of English. And uh, this is something that many, many top writers can do, um, and not just top writers, right? People all over the world are code switching all of the time. Those of you who go home uh, to your uh, families in uh, Swabia um, will probably not send text messages to them that look the same as the essays that you write for the university. That's just basic writing skills. Okay, so the word order patterns, verb second is retained until nearly the end of the, uh, of the Middle English period, but by the end it's starting to fade out and we start to find a mixture of other orders, especially the rigid SVO order that we associate with modern English today. Now, there's another factor that we need to take into account, which is the transition from OV to VO. Um, now, if you remember, when we talk about Old English, verb second only applies to finite verbs, just like it does in modern German. And if you ignore all the finite verbs in main clauses, and if you look at non-finite verbs, and if you look at subordinate clauses, what you find is that Old English is mostly an OV language. And here we have an example from uh, Alfred on Twam Thingum, Half the God, Thasmanus Saula Yagordod. In two things had God the man's soul endowed. So here we have a finite verb, but we can ignore that. It's in uh, second position, then you've got the subject God. Um, and then 
we've got the non-finite verb right at the end, just like we would expect in modern German too. So, jegorod, the past participle, is here at the end. Um, and this illustrates that we're dealing with an OV word order here, because the object here is the man's soul, das Mannes Saula. So that precedes the non-finite verb. And in modern English, of course, that shifts. And the time that this shifts is roughly during the Middle English period. This is a very, very slow shift. The shift from OV to VO takes a really, really long time. We find VO examples in Old English, and we continue to find OV examples as late as texts like Shakespeare in the King James Bible, though by that point they're not very frequent, and they mostly occur in very specific contexts, such as with negation and quantifiers. Um, but in Middle English, we already start to find many, many, many VO sentences. So here we have Chaucer, I will tell a legend and a leaf. I will tell a legend and a life. And the object here is legend and a life, and the non-finite verb here is tell. So here, the non-finite verb precedes the object, and that shows that we've got VO word order, verb object word order. Okay, subjects. So, as we've seen before, Old English is not a language that needs to express subjects overtly. It's not a language where every sentence has to have a subject. Um, it's quite laid back in that regard. Middle English is not nearly as chilled out. So, in Middle English, you start to develop this requirement that we have today, where every sentence has to have a subject in it somewhere. And this is something uh, that develops during this Middle English period, particularly after 1250. Um, and this includes what's called pleonastic subjects, or expletive subjects, or sometimes dummy subjects. These all mean the same thing. And there are two dummy subjects. There's a dummy it, as in, it seems that it is sunny outside. The first it is a, an expletive it, a dummy it. Um, and the other one is there, um, the expletive there, as in, this example, there was his son, there was a man outside. This there is not purely locative, it has instead a, an expletive function. It's used in particular types of sentences um, where, um, where there is no overt subject at the beginning of the clause. So this is something, again, that we can start to see in Chaucer's English. The other thing that we see is that in Old English, it doesn't really seem to matter that much whether the subject is nominative, in nominative case, um, or something else. And that's something uh, that changes in the Middle English period. Um, so here we've got uh, Lachamon's Brut again, and in this text, uh, therefore him often shamed. Um, the verb uh, shame um, in Old English takes uh, a subject in the dative or accusative. In modern English, it takes, like every other verb, a subject in the nominative. And what we see in the later version of the same text, so this is a later scribe who's copying the same text, this later scribe has corrected it. And he's corrected this dative subject into a nominative subject. So instead of this him that we see in the earlier version, in the Caligula version of the text, in the later version, we see a he. So, the, any, so basically, we, we start to move towards this system where every sentence has an overt subject and that subject is in the nominative case. So in Middle English, you can start to see most of the properties of the present-day language emerging you can start to see how the language develops in the way that it does. Certainly in terms of syntax, there is a huge amount of change during this Middle English period. Here are some other uh, examples. Um, in modern English, we have sequences of auxiliaries, so we can have many auxiliaries stacked up. In a sentence like, we should have been practicing, we've got three um, sort of auxiliary verbs. Um, and these are not very common in Old English, but in Middle English they start to become more common. Um, so we have sentences like this one from Chaucer, 
if e so after michta have you added be um, if I might have been married so often, might have been, all these three auxiliaries stacking up uh, one after the other. And uh, since the Old English period, we get different tenses emerging, tenses and aspects that are called periphrastic or analytical. Uh, periphrastic because it's a whole phrase to do what in some languages are you, is, is done with one word. So if you're familiar with a language like French or Spanish, for instance, you'll see that in those languages um, there are lots of different verb forms, uh, imperfects and conditionals and that kind of thing. English doesn't go in for those very much. Instead, it just stacks up auxiliaries to give the same meaning. Um, so we find things like the new perfect, I have eaten the cake. Uh, this is something that we find from Old English onwards. It's probably a common West Germanic development, but it gets more and more common throughout the Old English period. The passive too, uh, like uh, he was eaten, uh, this is something that we also see from the Old English period onwards. The progressive, on the other hand, that's something that is very, very characteristic of English, all of these ing forms. That's something that we only see robustly from the Middle English period onwards. We don't really find progressives, at least not very often, in Old English. So this progressive is something that comes f into the language in a really productive way from Middle English onwards, and it's been increasing in frequency ever since. Um, and it hasn't stopped. Even today, the progressive is getting more and more frequent, um, which suggests that maybe in 100 years' time, every single word that we use will end in ing. Who knows? Um, I would hope not. But uh, when you look at things, uh, at, at the development, it seems that the progressive is just going up and up and up in overall frequency. From this same period, we also see the earliest examples of dummy do. This is the do that we see in, in questions and in negative clauses. Do you like sunny weather? Or um, I don't know, with this do not form. We're going to hear more about this in future weeks because the dummy do development really takes off in the early modern English period, which we'll get to next time. So we'll be giving you, I'll be giving you more uh, on dummy do later on. Interestingly, both of these last two changes have been argued to be influenced by Celtic. So if you remember the, when the Anglo-Saxons arrived uh, on the British Isles, there were Celts already there. And those Celts had something that looked a bit like the progressive and something that looked a bit like dummy do. And so it's been argued that maybe uh, this Celtic usage was kind of hidden in the written texts for hundreds of years and only started to emerge in the Middle English period. That's one theory. These are not things that there is a great amount of consensus about. People who write about the history of the English language and who think about the history of the English language still argue about this kind of question. The infinitive marker two is often treated as a non-finite auxiliary after Middle English. Um, so this is why, where we get examples like for to hin, uh, hin efinde, to find, in order to find him. Um, and in the same period, we get what's called split infinitives emerging, where you have something intervening uh, between the, uh, the two and the uh, verb form that follows it. To not, and this example is from Wycliffe, so Middle English. Um, I say to y'all, to not swear on al manner. Um, so to not swear in any way. This is something, split infinitives is something that any native speaker of English will do. Um, it's just that if you look at certain prescriptive grammars, it will tell you not to do it. Um, why? No reason. Just because it's an arbitrary rule, um, mostly probably to make life more difficult for people like you who have to learn English as a non-native speaker. So, um, this kind of uh, bullshit rule is something that uh, is quite commonly found in grammar textbooks, but it has no real basis in grammatical reality uh, because ever since the Middle English period, people have been talking like this, and they will always continue to do so. If you remember Old and Middle English, uh, old, old English uh, in particular, you remember that you get these constructions which are called correlative constructions, where we've got tha da 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 da, tha da 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 da. 
You've got these constructions where two, in two consecutive clauses are introduced by a tha. Now, these clauses tend to disappear during the course of the Middle English period. And um, again, you can look at two different versions of the same text, uh, Lachamon's Brut, um, and you can see that the earlier version um, has thenne, thenne, so the two of the same, and the later version has wan and than, when and then. So this is something that we seem to see more of later on in the Middle English period. We see the, the scribes using two different, uh, two different elements to introduce clauses, rather than using these correlatives, um, these uh, correlatives where you've got the same element at the beginning of both clauses. We find a new subordinator during this period. We find till being used very robustly. Some people claim that comes from Old Norse, so it's a Viking influence, a Scandinavian influenced word. Um, so till becomes used more, and the word for also becomes used more, as in uh, the example we saw on the previous slide, um, for to hin find. In modern English, for to in, order, in that order is not grammatical, but we can use for in other uh, constructions. Uh, for instance, um, uh, something like, I wished for him to come. Um, or, yeah, with a for plus some kind of subject of the non-finite clause plus, a, uh, plus the verb with two. This for um, is, again, actually a kind of subordinator. It's a kind of non-finite subordinator. Um, if you're doing uh, English syntax, um, then you can think of for actually as being a, an element, uh, a C element. It's a complementizer. Another thing that happens during this period is that negation changes. In Old English, as we saw, there's a N before the finite verb. In Middle English, we get a new post-verbal negator being introduced. So in the Middle English period, um, we see uh, nawicht appearing. And this nawicht is ultimately going to, it looks a bit, at this stage, it looks a bit like German nicht, but it ultimately develops into modern English not. So this is the ancestor of not. And during the middle of the period, we see both ne and nawicht being used in the same sentence. And again, if you know any French, you might recognize this as being a bit like ne and pas in French. You have a pre-verbal negator and then a post-verbal negator as well. That doesn't last very long. That lasts for a few hundred years during the Middle English period. And by the end of the Middle English period, the original negator ne disappears entirely. And what we find is nat on its own or not just like we find in the modern language. So the major change to the history of negation in English is this one, and it happens during the Middle English period. This change is special enough to have a name of its own. It's called Jespersen's cycle, after the Danish linguist Otto Jespersen. And Otto Jespersen observed this change, interestingly, not only in English, but also in the history of many, many other languages as well. So it happens in French, it happens in German, it happens in languages all over Europe, um, but not only in Europe, it happens also in places uh, in, in Berber, um, in non-Indo-European languages such as Estonian, and so on and so forth. So this change, where one negator comes to be reinforced by another negator, and then they co-occur for a while until the original negator is lost. That's something that we see in language after language around the world. Question. Um, that's a, a far more complicated question than I can answer right now. The question is, um, in Old English, there are instances, the, the default is if you have multiple negative expressions in the same sentence, like I never gave nothing to no one, um, they don't, so they don't cancel each other out. Two negatives do not make a positive in Old English. Um, in Modern English, in the standard, um, that's what is supposed to happen. So a sentence like, I never gave nothing to no one, um, is um, supposed to mean, um, it was never the case that I didn't give, ah, uh, uh, 
Um, this is, these are hard. But they're supposed to cancel each other out anyway. Um, there's two things that are relevant here. Um, one is that it, it's that change, it's not exactly clear when it happened, uh, but sometime between late Middle English and the modern English period. The second important thing is that in many, many varieties of English worldwide, it's still the case that two negatives together reinforce each other. Um, this is a, uh, a feature, a linguistic feature, called negative concord, where two negative expressions rather agree with each other, reinforce each other, rather than cancel each other out. There are many other varieties worldwide that work like this as well. Um, so it's a very good question. Uh, when did English lose negative concord? Part of the answer is from late Middle English to modern English. The other part of the answer is some varieties never lost it at all. Right. And actually, those languages, such as, for instance, African-American vernacular English, in the States, uh, also many northern and uh, south southwestern varieties of English in Britain, um, these varieties actually reflect an older form of the language. They re they're reflecting the situation as it was in Old English. Which is interesting, because often people describe these newer, younger varieties, these less prestigious varieties, um, like dialects and vernaculars as being, having undergone changes, changes that make them different from the standard. But in fact, very often, it's the other way around. It's the standard language that has changed, and the dialects and the vernaculars are just retaining the original historical form. Any other questions? So, let's take another look at this passage from Gawain again. Um, so here we've got... Um, uh, since the siege and the assault was seized at Troy, um, the, the, the Borg, um, the city or the castle, um, brightened, um, br brightened and burned uh, to brands and ashes, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, the important thing is that when we look at this, the word order mostly looks like the modern language. Um, we get the subject preceding the auxiliary. So in this first sentence, the siege and the assault, the siege and the assault is the subject, it's a coordinated subject. And then we've got the finite verb was, which is written what's here. Um, this isn't always the case, so we also find relative clauses that retain the old word order, um, the OV word order um, with the verb right at the end, just like you find in subordinate clauses in modern German. Because here the finite verb is rocht, um, wrought or made, and it's right at the end of the, uh, right at the, end of the clause. It's a relative clause. Um, interestingly also, the relative clause that we find here is formed with that, the invariant element that. And in early Middle English, this is basically the only relative clause introducer. Um, later on in, early, in Middle English, we get who and which emerging as relativizers as well. Uh, but in the early Middle English period, we only see relative clauses introduced by this word that. So a quick summary of the syntactic changes that we've uh, seen in Middle English undergo. The word order is changing. It changes from VO, uh, from uh, V2, or rather. It changes from V2 to SVO. Um, the, the subject requirement becomes very firm. Every clause needs a subject in the nominative. Uh, we also get pleonastic subjects, dummy subjects, being introduced. We get auxiliaries being introduced. We get articles being introduced. We also get new conjunctions being introduced. So there's lots more of these little words, little invariant words, that are popping up to express meaning, where earlier the same nuances of meaning were expressed by morphology, by different inflectional endings. And in negation, we see Jespersen cycle occurring. So the pre-verbal ne negator gets replaced by the post-verbal not negator. And this all happens within the Middle English period. So there's a huge amount of syntactic change during this Middle English period. And if you want to read more about it, there are a few references here 
that are also given at the end of the slides. Any questions about syntax before we move on? Yes. So the question is, how is the pleonastic subject expressed in Old English? Um, and the answer is, is as you anticipated, it, it wasn't. So in a sentence like, it seems that it is sunny outside, you would just get, um, seems that is sunny outside. You just, you just leave it out entirely. Um, same with a sentence like, um, there is a man in the garden, you would just get, is a man in the garden. So you just leave it out entirely. Great question, right. So the question is, how do we know uh, that this hymn, given that Old English didn't, given that Old English and Early Middle English didn't need a subject in the nominative at all, how do we know that this sentence isn't just a clause with no subject, where the hymn is just in there as some kind of uh, as, as some kind of non-subject constituent. In a, and this will be a lot like German sentences like mir ist kalt, right? In a sentence like mir ist kalt, where is the subject? Most people would say there isn't one, right? Most grammarians would analyze um, German, a German construction like mir ist kalt um, as having no subject at all, and the mir is just a dative experience, it's a dative object. And if that's the case, how can we be sure that that wasn't also true for Old English. And the answer is too complicated for me to actually give, but there are tests that you can use uh, in Old English uh, to determine whether we're dealing with a subject or an object. Um, so there are subjecthood tests, um, and these have particularly been developed over the last 30 years or so um, to try and figure out when we're really dealing with a subject and when we're not. And there has been an argument about this in the literature, so people argue about whether these things are really subjects uh, or objects. Um, but if you look, for instance, at um, uh, this book by Fisher et al., they have some discussion. Uh, so this is the bright orange book about uh, Middle English syntax. Uh, about early English syntax, and they have some discussion. So I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer right now, but it would take too much time, and I don't have the slides for it. Uh, but it's a very, very good question. Any other questions? Okay, so, word formation. We've already touched on this a bit when we were talking about the influence of French last time. And um, we can look at all kinds of different uh, words and structures and look at the new words that are emerging in the history of the language. Um, the first major source that we found for new words in Old English was compounding, and we don't quite find as much compounding uh, in Middle English as we do in Old English. Uh, and this is perhaps because, if you recall last time, there are a lot of borrowed words in Middle English. So Old English is a language that likes to create its own words from scratch to put them together out of existing forms. Middle English, on the other hand, borrows words from other languages. It borrows them from Scandinavian, it borrows them from French, and it borrows them from Latin in particular during the Middle English period. If you go onto oed.com, the online OED, um, you have to, I think, be uh, within the University of Konstanz network for this to work. Um, you can use the advanced search to search for whichever compounds emerged in a particular year. So this is the first year that these compounds were attested. Um, for 1230, for instance, we find certain words emerging. Um, dunghill, um, there is an image of a dunghill here. Um, it is what it sounds like, basically. It's a hill that's made of dung. Um, we get polecat, which is one of these guys. If I'm honest, I don't know why these guys are called a polecat, because they're not a cat that's made out of poles or anything like that. Uh, that's just what we call them. Um, and um, we also have love drink, and I, I don't actually know what that is either. I presume it's something that's like a love potion. So you drink it to make someone fall in love with you. But this is not really a word that has survived in the modern English language. Um, and that's an important fact too. We shouldn't think of the history of the language in terms of the lexicon as a straight line. Sometimes new words emerge and then get lost again. 
So sometimes some words last a really long time, some words last hundreds, uh, last thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. Sometimes a new word pops up and then uh, disappears again. Um, a nice example of that would be um, when people in America called things rad to mean cool. Right. Mostly, that just causes Americans to cringe if you do it these days. Um, so, uh, rad uh, is not a word that lasted very long. As far as Middle English is concerned, um, Christiana Dalton Puffer's book on Middle English word formation gives you everything uh, that you need to know, and then some, if you want to find out more. Old English... Uh, and Middle English had derivational suffixes. As we saw last time, those derivational suffixes are added to in the Middle English period. So we get, the, as well as the old noun suffix, this is just abstract nouns, dorm, herde, uh, which is like modern hood, ship, and ing, and ung. Um, these words, uh, these suffix are added to by Romance ones like assi, aj, al, ons, asion, Uri, ite, and ment. All of these are new suffixes that develop during the Middle English period. And again, Chaucer is in on the action here. Chaucer uses the old suffixes, but he also uses the new suffixes. And it seems like he has a preference for the new ones. So if you count all of the instances um, of Dom in the Canterbury Tales, you find 45 of them. But if you count Aj, you find 389. And they basically mean roughly the same thing. So it seems like the new Romance suffixes uh, from French are much more popular at this stage. <clears throat> As we saw last time, there are some complications. The interesting question is how productive are they? Do they occur with native uh, stems, with uh, Germanic stems, or are they only in uh, borrowed words? And the answer is... In the, in the earliest uses, they only occur in French borrowings, and in the later uses, we start to see them also being used with other kinds of stem as well. And it's the same story with agent nouns and the same story with adjectives. So from Old English, we retain words like, uh, we turn en retain agent endings like the uh, famous ER ending, uh, the END ending, the L ending and the Ling ending. Um, some of these are less productive today. Some of them, like Er, are very productive still. And we get new ones, romance ones like Ant, Ard, Ari, Erel, Esse, Ist, Istra, and Ur, um, added on to the end of words. Adjectives too, we find them retained, so Ed, En, etc. And we find new ones from romance like a bull, Al, Iv, and us, some of which are extremely, extremely productive today. So the uh, derivational system of Middle English gets a real boost by the addition of all of these French and Romance derivational suffixes. I say Romance because usually they're from French, but sometimes it's not, sometimes they're from Latin, and it's sometimes not clear whether they're from French or from Latin, because we don't have the ability to distinguish between them in cases where French and Latin both work the same way. And since French is roughly descended from Latin, that's not surprising. All right, we also see semantic changes during this period. So we see changes uh, where words like beginning and commencement, uh, beginning is an old English word, commencement is a borrowing from French. It's got this ment suffix, right? This derivational suffix that comes from Romance. Um, and uh, in Middle English, these words mean exactly the same thing. But later on, and this often happens when you get two words that mean the same thing, one of them specializes. It takes on a very specialized meaning. Uh, and from 1387 onwards, commencement starts to get a very specialized meaning. It means uh, that you get a, a master's degree or a doctoral degree. Um, and nowadays, no one ever really talks about commencement except in this context. And it's a particularly American usage. We don't really, do it. We don't really talk about commencement in Britain either. Um, so in this case, two words that originally meant the same thing have gone in different directions. One of them stayed the same, and the other one narrowed its semantic range. This is often true, as I've said. Borrowed words often start out in direct competition with a native word, meaning exactly the same thing. Um, adolescence, for instance, is a romance borrowing. 
Um, originally, it just meant youth, so the state of being young. Um, in modern English, it means something more specific. Um, you're an adolescent. Um, the adolescence is specifically uh, the period of puberty. Um, so adolescents are really between like 12 and 18. So, uh, and obviously there's the famous case, biscuits versus cookies in British English. In American English, uh, they, the word biscuit um, is either not used or hardly used. Um, in British English, we have both. So we have biscuits and we have cookies. And, and cookies are a subtype of biscuit, but they are a very specific subtype in that they're the type with, that they're round and they've got little bits of chocolate or raisins or something like that in them. Right? Not all biscuits are cookies, but all cookies are biscuits if you're British. If you're American, that's crazy to you probably, but that's how we work in Britain. Any questions about the uh, word formation, the lexicon and the semantics in Middle English? All right, um, finally then, before we move on to looking at some sample exam questions, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Middle English dialects. Now, you will recall that before, when we talked about Old English dialects, I was very negative. I was saying, well, we can't really know all that much about Old English dialects because we just don't have texts from all that many places. All we have is a few individual monasteries from which these dialects have survived. The same is true, incidentally, for Old High German. Uh, so if you want to look for German texts from the relevant period, there are texts from Reichenau, there are texts from St. Gallen, um, and there are texts from other such places where there was a famous monastery during the time, uh, but there are not texts from any old place. You have, you have a very, very restricted range of centers where texts are produced. In Middle English, this starts to broaden out compared to Old English. So we see in Middle English, we can really start to talk about specific dialects, um, and uh, in particular, we can divide them into southern dialects, uh, West Midlands, East Midlands, Kentish, um, something that we can call Humber or Yorkshire or something like that, and then a northern dialect for everything north of that. During this Middle English period, we have very, very little from Wales, uh, almost nothing from Wales, almost nothing from Ireland, and almost nothing from Scotland. That comes later. Towards the very end of the Middle English period, we start to get texts from these places. Even Northern England isn't very well represented until after 1300. But during the Middle English period, we see this broadening out. We see more dialects, more people writing, uh, more people using the English language for all kinds of different purposes. Um, so we get much more dialect var variety. We see that Old and Middle English sound changes didn't have the same impact in every area of the country. Um, so, for instance, something that we talked about in the context of Old English was the palatalization of k and j and g. So k becoming ch in particular and g becoming uh, y. And this is something that really arguably, it's not, it, again, it's debated, but one view, the main view, is that this only happens in the south of the country. So these specific things are only found in the south. Um, and in the, uh, in the northern varieties, the k and the g were retained. That's why um, you will see place names um, in kirk in the north and church in the south. It's the same word. One of them has palatalization, the other one doesn't. Similarly, um, Manchester, which is in the north, but not super far north, versus Lancaster. This is an example that we used before. Um, something special happens in the south that doesn't make it into the standard, but that does make it into the southern uh, varieties of dialects. Uh, and that's voicing of initial fricatives. This is a useful one to remember. Um, so words like father become father, uh, or words like fox become vox. Um, what else? Anything you can imagine. A fish becomes a vish. Um, a, um, yeah. Um, f sh um, sir becomes z with a z. Uh, so all of these changes um, start to happen in the south. 
And we also get change of long R becoming OR uh, in the south, but not in the north. Other changes happen in the north. So um, SH, for instance, the SH sound that we find in Old English, in words like English, with a SH, um, become S. Um, so, sorry, this actually comes out really horrible when you listen to it on the, uh, on the online audio, I think, if I do too many sibilants and shibilants, but uh, you're just going to have to deal with it. Um, these things are typical of the north of the country. So the word English becomes English with a S. In general, um, what we see, and this is oversimplifying, but it's a, it, it's a rough generalization. We see more sound change in the south and more morphological change in the north. So in general, the, sound, the sounds change more in the southern dialects and the morphology, the endings, change more in the northern dialects. Um, the loss of endings starts in the north, um, so the reduction, the, the move towards a more analytic morphology is something that we see more of in northern texts. And we also see third-person pronouns being replaced in the north. Remember, we talked about third-person pronouns um, the last couple of lectures. And the East Midlands, it behaves more like the north. So um, this bit over here, there's a kind of northeastern effect from these areas, and then the West Midlands behaves a little bit more like the south. So you can kind of draw a rough line uh, down the country, sort of here, between, from London where, and the, es the Thames estuary up towards Liverpool, and the northeastern dialects are more morphologically innovative, and the southwestern dialects have more sound changes. This is very, very rough and oversimplificatory, um, and some of this might well have to do with the Scandinavian influence that we talked about two weeks ago. But there's a lot to be said about this. So here's a table um, of some of the features that set apart uh, the North, Midlands, and Southern varieties. In general, the Midlands are in the middle, so they behave like they're in the middle as well. It's harder to identify Midlands texts because usually they display a mixture of Northern features and Southern features. So palatalization of velas, um, this is something that we have already dis that, um, uh, we've discussed. Um, the North doesn't really do palatalization. Um, so a word like uh, frankis would be found in the North, uh, corresponding to French with a ch. So this palatalization um, is something that happens uh, only in the South, not in the North. And in the Midlands, we find both. In terms of long R becoming OR, uh, we see this, not happen, this doesn't happen in the north. Um, so the word home is home in the, in the south, or something like HOME. And in the north, it would be HAM still. And the same with a word like TO. In, uh, in the south, it would be TWO. In the north, it would be TWA. And in the Midlands, the Midlands in this respect mainly behave like the South. Short on and an behave the other way round. Um, so the word man, for instance, is man in the South, but in the North it is mon. And uh, in the Midlands you get a mixture of the two. In terms of initial fricatives, this is something I've already mentioned. You've got this change only in the South. This is, this is an absolute killer giveaway. If you find this change, you know that you're dealing with a southern text. It can't be anything else. So this voicing of initial fricatives, words like father and vish and zur, rather than father and fish and sir. Um, the north also has a special spelling um, with a Q-U for uh, words that in other varieties end up being spelled with a W-H. So words like who, what, when, where. In most of the Middle English texts, they're spelt HW or WH later on. In the North, for some reason, they're spelt with a QU. They're never pronounced like this. This is a purely spelling change. Um, but uh, it's still very noticeable when you have Northern texts. Also, early Scots texts look like this as well. 
probably unsurprising that Scots behaves more like Northern English than it does like Southern English. And then finally, there is fronting of the sh to s, which I've already mentioned. Um, so a word like shall stays the same in the south, but in the north it becomes a s, so sal. So shall becomes sal. And other words beginning with a sh uh, come to begin with a s. Next slide has morphology and syntax on it. Um, and again, this is mostly summarizing stuff that we've already seen. Um, so in terms of the third person pronoun, um, in the north, we get they and them. In the Midlands, we get a mixture. We get they in the nominative, but hem in the uh, objective, in the accusative and, and dative, which then merge, which have combined by this point. And in the south, he and hem are retained for longer. Of course, this is all relative. So when you look at late texts, sometimes they've changed more. Um, but on the whole, these generalizations hold pretty well. Um, it's the same with she. So the new feminine pronoun she, which we talked about before, develops in the north. In the south, uh, in the Midlands, you get a mixture. And in the south, you get the old pronoun he. Um, the present tense ending s, as opposed to th, also develops in the north. So um, he loves versus he loveth, he does versus he doth. Uh, these, these forms are found first in the north. As for the present participle, the ing forms are found more often in the south. So we get um, ing and inde in the south, and we get ander and ender in the, uh, in the north and in the Midlands. Um, the past participle also loses its prefix in the north. Actually, remember, this prefix isn't just a past participle prefix. It's also found on other verb forms. Um, but where it's found, it's found in the Midlands and in the South. We don't find it in the North. This, again, could be due to influence from Scandinavian, because Scandinavian had already lost all of its verbal prefixes at a much, much earlier stage. In the North, we also find a very specific um, Accusative marker, uh, sorry, infinitive marker, an infinitive marker at. Uh, we find it alongside to, and we don't find it anywhere else. So if you see an at where you would expect to see a to, that means that you're dealing with a northern text. Um, so this is something, all of these features, um, you can, some of them are very, very clear identifiers, some of them are a bit vaguer. Um, but one of the things that always comes up on the exam uh, as one of the more difficult questions that you have to answer is how is here you've got a little text, which dialect is this from? So you have to do the kind of detective work to figure out which Middle English dialect you're dealing with here. So when you're revising, you will probably find yourself looking at these two slides very carefully. Okay, so here's an example of what we just saw. I've given you here the tables on the right-hand side, and uh, here is a text, and I want you to figure out, I want you to tell me whether we're dealing with uh, a northern, a midlands, or a southern text. Okay, a few hands starting to go up. What do you think? A northern text. Right, you've got a nice clear feature here, at, for the common at understand. This means to understand. Now, this is actually harder than what you'll get in the actual exam, because in the actual exam, you get a translation of the Middle English, whereas here, I haven't given you one. But you can still hopefully see that this at is, is in a place where you would expect a to. So it's at understand, and this at is a surefire, where is it? There it is. It's a surefire marker that you're dealing with a northern text. So that's just one thing. And there are many other features as well. Can anyone else tell me a northern feature of this text that we see here? Right, down at the bottom here, we've got quat. Right? But it's not pronounced quat, it's pronounced what. And this word is, this is this feature here. So we've got a QU feature that you only find in the north of the country, never in the south. So that's two features straight away that tell you this can only be a northern text. And there are a few other bits and pieces as well that you can use. So if you take a word like English, 
or Frankis, so we've got Inglis up here and uh, Frankis down here. These are English and Frankish. So here we're dealing with this change that we saw, where is it, where is it, where is it? There, here it is. We see the sh becoming a s. Right? And, and again, that's a northern or midlands feature. So we can narrow it down. It's all about using different sources of evidence that converge on the same thing. In this last word, frankis, we also see lack of palatalization. So remember, this word means French, but we don't see palatalization of the k. It doesn't become a ch. So it stays as a k. And that, again, is a distinctively northern feature, also found to some extent in the Midlands. So all of the evidence, there are at least four different things here, uh, probably more, though we don't have time to go into them, uh, that will tell you that what we're dealing with here is a northern text rather than anything else. Any questions? So here we go. Um, I'd forgotten I had this slide. Uh, this is just what I basically just said, so I'm going to skip over it. You can use it as a reference in your own time if you wish. And here are some of the well-known texts that we find during the Middle English period, along with which dialect they belong to. So some famous texts are uh, northern texts, like the Curse of Mundi and the York Plays. Others, like Sir Gawain that we saw this time, are West Midlands texts. We have quite a lot also from the East Midlands, like the Peterborough Chronicle and, that you've already seen, and the Ormulum that we talked about. Um, and the real heavy hitters of the late Middle English period, like Chaucer and Gower, um, they are in the south, or at least their writing for the public is in a southern variety of Middle English, a London-type variety of Middle English. Okay, so um, moving on now to some sample exam questions. I'm just going to fire these at you and see how you do. Um, given, you, given, you, given that you haven't had particularly any revision yet, you shouldn't be too worried if you can't answer some of these. Um, but... Um, this, I think, is just to give you a flavour of what the exam is going to look like. So here is the structure of the exam. It's multiple choice. There are 36 questions. And within the exam, there are four sections. Uh, each of them has nine questions. So there's an Old English section. Here you'll get a little text. You'll get a little translation of the text. So you don't have to translate the Old English yourself. You have, you, you, um, you'll get nine questions about that text. Nine questions on Middle English, nine questions on Early Modern English, and then there is a kind of random selection of other stuff in the final section. So this is a sort of general section, with, which is not based on any kind of text. Um, the exam will include the paradigms for Old English, as I've mentioned before, so you don't have to memorise all of those paradigms. All you'll have to do is be able to use them. So when you, you'll have to think, OK, that thing is a demonstrative. I know it's a demonstrative, but I don't remember which case form it's in. You can just turn over the page, look at the paradigm, point it out, uh, and that will help you answer the questions here. Um, obviously, though, uh, there are time limitations, so you can't take too long over any of this. Um, there is a sample exam available on, on Ilias. I actually need to update the sample exam that's on there. It's a slightly out-of-date version. Um, I'll try and stick that up there straight after the lecture today. Um, today, I'm just going to go through the sample Middle English section with you. Um, so here we've got our text at the top, and we've got a little translation down here, and here is the first question. Uh, which actually, in this case, is also one of the nastier questions on the exam. So the question is, the word castel is a borrowing from which language? Ooh, we've got hands going up already. That's good. That shows that people have been paying attention. All right, uh, yes. Uh, Latin, uh, why do you figure that? Um, it's actually... Uh, not, but I can see how you get to the reasoning, because you do have Latin castel as a stem, uh, but it actually, comes, it actually comes from somewhere else. And we discussed this. Uh, this was one of the words that actually came up in the video lectures last time. So Anglo-Norman, yeah. Um, it's specifically Anglo-Norman, and um, it's, we know it's Anglo-Norman um, because it's a very early French borrowing. Um, it doesn't show any palatalization here. <coughs> So it's not like French chateau, um, it's, uh, the, uh, it's a word um, that is uh, found first in 
early Middle English texts. We don't actually find it in the Old English period. Um, now that's a particularly, the reason this is a mean question, I wouldn't ask you this about just any random word, right? The reason I am asking this question is because it actually came up in the lecture. Um, so that's why um, this one is, uh, is, uh, Lat is uh, Anglo-Norman. And this, that's why I'm asking about this one specific word. This is an unusual type of question. Most of the questions are more general. Like this one, so this is question two. What's the person and number of the verbs maddest and locust? Like I say, in the exam you will get the Old English paradigms, but you might already recognize this ending simply by your inherent knowledge of German, if you have such a thing. Yes. Second person singular, yes. This is a second person singular ending. Um, this ST ending is only ever found in the second person singular. And um, it's, very, it's a very striking ending. Uh, like I say, in the exam, you will be able to look this kind of thing up in the paradigms. Because although this is Middle English, you can assume that the Old English behaves the same um, unless otherwise stated. Okay, so that's question, uh, question two. Um, there are, because of time, I'm going to, I think, skip some of these questions. We won't be able to do all of them. Um, this one is quite interesting, though, so let's do this one. Um, there are second-person pronouns in this text. There is thou and there is ye. And what you need to figure out here is how they are used. So it starts out, Holy Archangel Michael, Saint Gabriel and Raphael, um, you, ye bring me to the castle. And then you've got, referring to Jesus specifically, thou. So uh, what does that suggest? Ye is plural and thou is singular. Yeah, that seems to be the most plausible explanation here. It's certainly more plausible than this one. Ye is familiar and thou is polite. Because why would you be familiar with the Archangel Michael, Saint Gabriel and Raphael and only be polite to Jesus? Right. That seems weird. Plus we know that if anything, the di distribution was the other way around. And this is something we covered before. Um, and similarly, the other two explanations cannot possibly be right. So sometimes with these multiple choice questions, you'll have to use process of elimination. When you've eliminated the answers that you know are wrong, then only the answer that remains, only, if there's only one answer that remains, that must be the right one. Right? Classic Sherlock Holmes logic. Okay, word initial voicing. We've just been discussing this, so it should be fresh in your mind. Um, we've got word initial voicing in one of these words. Which one? Seventy, yes. Yeah. So this is word, it's the word seventy, uh, but rather than seventy, it is zzzzventy. Right, it's got a very clear voicing. Uh, and you're not allowed to talk in the exam, but if you want to make incomprehensible phonetic noises under your breath uh, in order to test hypotheses, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, so, um, you can tell that it's not holy because that's not voiced anyway. And these two here, um, this, these are words that would be voiced anyway in the standard language, um, so they don't illustrate word initial voicing specifically here. So, 70 is the right answer. And if you're smart, you'll already be thinking, ha, huh, that might tell us something about where this text comes from. Okay, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, so, we've got the clause, Fer alle saulen vareth well. Where all souls fare well. What's the subject doing in this sentence? Does it A, remain unexpressed, B, follow the verb, C, precede the verb, or is it D, non-referential? It precedes the verb, yeah. This actually, if you know what a subject is, this one's fairly straightforward, because all, because all souls is simply the subject of the sentence, and if you know that, and then you know that fair is the verb, so this vareth is like um, German fahren, right? It's to fare, to travel. And um, it's got word initial voicing again. So instead of fareth, you have vareth. Finally, the million dollar question. I say that, though it's worth exactly the same number of points as all of the other questions. Which dialect is this text written in? It's southern. Yes, 
How do we know that this is southern? What's our big clue? It's actually a linguistic feature that we've literally just discussed. Right, so we've got yurita, uh, and this y prefix is something that is lost in the north. So the north doesn't have this. So that rules out the north. It doesn't really narrow it down. It could, in principle, um, still be a, uh, a, a Midlands text. Um, but uh, we can be fairly confident that it's southern because it has one feature that really only occurs in southern texts. Voicing, yes, the word initial voicing that I keep banging on about, right? So if you see lots of vers and zers at the beginning of words where you would expect to see a f or a s, like this we've got um, vor penny, vor mark, and vor pound. Um, we've got our um, uh, z 70 Right? Uh, and we've got all of these words that begin with a voiced fricative, um, and that is our distinctly southern feature. So we can tell um, that this is a specifically southern feature here. So the answers are these, uh, D, B, A, C, B, D, A, C, C. We, missed, we skipped through a few. If you want to look at some of these uh, in your own time, by all means do. Like I said, I still need to update the most recent version of this exam so that it is actually correct. Um, but I will do that uh, later today. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions about these exam uh, questions? So the, yes, I said you would have a cheat sheet provided. The cheat sheet is just the sheet with the paradigms on it. right? So you'll have the paradigms given. And that will be uh, something that you don't need to memorize. Um, there are other things that it's worth learning by heart, obviously, for this course. Uh, but you don't need to, borrow, bo to, wo to, bleh, to worry about learning the details of the paradigms like that. Okay, that will be provided for you with the exam. Okay, then just to wrap up, um, we see a lot of things happening in Middle English. We see a, a change from synthetic to analytic. We see verb second and OV word order shifting gradually to SVO word order. Um, in terms of word formation, the big change is from uh, compounding, which is what we see in Old English, to more use of loan words and derivational morphology in Middle English. And we see a lot of variables that tell us what dialect we're dealing with, with interestingly many morphological variants seeming to arise first in the north. Uh, and hopefully uh, this last part will give you some idea of what's going on in the exam and what to expect. Okay, here are your tasks for next time. Um, remember also that you can give me feedback using the link that was provided at the beginning of the slide set. Please do, I'm interested to hear what you think. And uh, next time we'll be moving on to early modern English. That's it for now. <laughs>